and here we go. So, can we ignore the situation in our culture? My God, as this card-carrying social psychologist, I'll say, no, we can't, right? So, reading subjective emotions can be affected by one's current state, mood, or chronic dispositions. So, when I'm looking at someone and trying to determine what emotion they're experiencing, right, it might be affected by my perspe perceptions and goals, right? Uh, Dodge showed ambiguous videos of children to other children, right? And he said, hey, tell me about the, the kid in the video. And what they found is children that were rated as chronically aggressive watched ambiguous videos and said, well, that child's being aggressive. That is, they were prepared because they're aggressive children to see the behaviors exhibited as aggressive when they were actually ambiguous. So this goes back to what Ekman was saying, that moods can predispose us to understand or view the world through a certain lens. And if these moods are the result of a chronic disposition, that is hostility, then we may see other people as being more hostile than they actually are. Now that's a kind of on an individual basis, right? Culture can affect, especially when it relates to language. And we've asked this question a couple of times. Can you feel it if there's no word? And I'm going to leave that still up to you. But the, the Chewong have no word for happiness. Surprise doesn't exist for the four, the Dani, the Iflak, right? The Zulu use a container metaphor to describe emotion. Like a long heart would be a tremendous capacity for love. A short heart is someone who's quick to anger and is probably not very empathetic. So we can see that these different theories, right, as, as we saw, uh, then, in fact, then get further complicated by the culture and, and by language. So let's talk about homework six here for a minute. It's a, a new model for intensity and duration, and, and uh, I thought this would be fun for us to do. Let us then start talking about developing not a general model of emotion as we saw on that sheet, but we're going to deviate slightly from that in let's talk more in the Ekman fashion about chronic dispositions for emotion, that is uh, about people and individuals. So I want two folks to create four questions that assess the duration and intensity of emotional experience. So two questions, and this would be a questionnaire that you would give someone. And, and an example question is, uh, to what extent do your emotions tend to persist? Not at all, to totally, right? And, and it's probably going to be on a five-point scale, so you know, or a seven-point scale, make it an odd scale, and, and, and label each point on the scale, right? So two of your team members are going to look at duration, that is how long do emotions last, and the extent to which those emotions are intense. So duration is short to long, right, or instant to like frickin' forever, and emotional intensity is very little in the way of emotional experience to very intensely felt or experienced, right? So two questions to capture a person on either of those. All team members then, part two, are going to answer the questionnaires. So remember, you guys got to time these assignments out, and this is by design. You got to determine your interim deadlines. Boy, when are we going to have this part done? When are we going to have this part done? When are we going to have this part done? Hopefully working back from the eventual due date, due date right? So then all team members answer the questionnaire. All right, that's just four questions. Two folks score the questionnaire for all team members, right? And two folks then create a graph that shows the relationship of the intensity to the duration that has four quadrants with all six scores pace placed in, in the graphic. So that is you would have an axis for intensity from low intensity to high intensity and duration, short duration to long duration, right? Okay. And, and, and that's the, the measurement scoring. And, and then consider why this might be useful. Any ideas on why this might be useful? And, and what do we learn from, from knowing the intensity or duration comparison between two people? So let's talk about maybe two people who cohabitate, who live together, who are partners. One person might experience emotions very strongly, but strangely, you know, the very strong, intense emotional reactions, but they don't last very long. So like they experience it very strongly, but they get over it almost immediately. Whereas other people maybe experience emotions not too intensely, but 
those emotions tend to persist for those people. So let's suppose those two people get into an argument. How does it look as the argument resolves, right? One, one person may be still feeling the pain from that argument, maybe not at a high level, but feels it over a long period of time, where the other person felt very intense level of pain, but it diminished almost immediately, right? Or, and, and those are like two opposites that I'm describing, but, but in fact, it could be low duration and low intensity or high duration and high intensity. So this is an individual difference measure. It really doesn't have to do with emotion theory. It's exploring these two notions. And the, the assignment is, is far more complete when you look at that. And please ask your questions as they occur. Uh, what else might we need to consider, include, to make this individual difference measure more meaningful or useful? So really, I'm asking you guys to kind of put your researcher's hat on. You're gonna gonna think like a researcher, behave like a researcher, and, and kind of unpack this uh, this idea. So uh, I expect to hear some questions about this. It would not surprise me at all. But there you go. So we got we got two things going. We got Ekman with the facial expressions for the discussion board, and, and that assignment, and then we've got this assignment as well. So let us then move from basic emotion to neural level emotional mechanisms. So we talked about the researchers who are trying to determine what were the basic emotions and their reason for including them as basic emotions or not. Let's start looking at the neural mechanisms. Let's start diving down into the brain. And, and a great place to start here is with Paul McLean. He developed this tripartite conceptualization of human functioning as it applies to the brain. Notice we've had a couple people throw tripartite explanations at us. I believe Plato was one correct right so this one's pretty straightforward pretty easy to understand we have the reptilian brain describes the brain stem and represents automatic functioning right mating aggression territoriality dominance submission self-defense all thought to be located you know deep down into the brain stem this ancient part of our brain notice the evolutionary flavor to this discussion right? Now, the mammalian brain which is built on top of the brain stem we call the limbic system, right? And what do we see? We see smell. We see temperature control. So now temperature control indicates this is the period of evolution where we move from cold-blooded to warm-blooded for some species, right? Requiring temperature control. Parental care, which is often associated with live birth, if you will. Um, you know, uh, mammalian birth, but, but there's exceptions to that as well. Long-term memory. Uh, what else? Uh, and, and vocal communication. Notice we're not saying language necessarily in terms of speaking the spoken language, but vocal communication. Birds would be included in this as well. The Papez circuit controls emotional evaluation and expression as well as circuits for emotional elaboration. So we can build on emotion, we can expand upon an emotion, we can recognize an emotion. So these are all critical qualities that come to us out of the limbic system. And notice this would include things like the amygdala and the hippocampus. Now the primate brain describes the neocortex. And this is problem solving, conscious memory, learning, speech, verbal comprehension. And this is the higher, what we call the more evolved species. So aquatic mammals like dolphins, right? Whales, certainly. Elephants would be in possession of this, as would the primates. This is also known as the word brain, as opposed to the illiterate limbic system. That language has been used to facilitate this, and it gets us to that interesting question. If emotions originate or are processed here in the mammalian brain, maybe basic emotions, right, and, and universal, but when we get to this area, when we start to talk about the neocortex, the question, if there's a word, not a word for it, can we feel it, becomes more appropriate. And so we see the, the triune brain in evolution. And we see the old brain, the reptilian complex, as it's called, and what it covers. Then we see the, the, the middle brain, right, the limbic complex and, and its components. And, and note that how, uh, and then the, uh, finally the neobrain or, or, or the cortex, as McLean is, is laying this out. This is McLean's idea. Not everyone agrees. But it does have kind of a, an appeal, certainly worth considering. Right? 
And then when you're developing your own emotion theory as the last activity in the class, you might then, you know, use this as, as a guiding uh, idea uh, among others. Now, the amygdala. I mentioned briefly just a moment ago, Ledoux uh, countered the general conception of the brain structures being built on top of each other. So he's kind of a McLean detractor, right? Increased complexity of creatures conforming to their place on the evolutionary tree. He didn't necessarily want to go there. And I think Darwin would probably appreciate his argument as well. Rather, the brain's a system of interconnected parts evolves as it's shaped by environmental pressures. And that's certainly Darwinistic, if you will. The amygdala is thought to be the seat of fight or flight, which represents aggression and fear. Okay. So what do we know about the amygdala? Well, it's two almond-shaped structures. Electrical stimulation has been demonstrated to cause experience of apprehension and anxiety. So we can actually cause these emotions to occur in participants by sti stimulating the amygdala. Right? Connections from the amygdala to the neocortex seem to process a certain level of directionality. And I was like, oh, what does that mean? It means that messages going out from the amygdala are favored over messages coming into the amygdala. Right? There are not very strong and numerous uh, connections from the amygdala to the neocortex. Right? Connections from the neocortex to the amygdala appear to be fewer and weaker. So two consequences kind of arise from this kind of biopsych approach to emotion, at least in terms of the amygdala. Fear and anxiety, man, we acquire that stuff readily. One trial learning, we can become afraid of a stimulus, right? But they can be hella difficult to unlearn. And that's the directionality. Fear responses to a stimulus can be encoded quite readily, but unencoding right, those connections can be difficult. The amygdala-generated emotions can be quite difficult to control. That is, we might not have the ability to necessarily inhibit them. So the connected amygdala, then, if we look at it, what we're talking about then is let us then start with the sensory thalamus, which is processing visual, auditory, somatic features, touch features, right? And this is going to then, we're going to look at, at a very, very quick system. Sensed fear is fast. Snake right, from the visual, or the feeling of a spider on my skin. You like that feeling, something crawling on you? Sensed fear, fast signal to the, to the amygdala, emotional memory. Notice this is right next to the hippocampus, so very fast responding, right? The hippocampus, the transition cortex, right? The hypothalamus then, straight off the emotion, takes action. So we got a super fast system. Oh, my God, spider, ah, brush it off. Right? This happens almost instantaneously. We have a fast system. We have a slow system. Now the more slow deliberative system, and notice these signals go to the amygdala, but they also go to the sensory cortex for more elaborate perceptual processing. Transitional cortex then, in fact, takes this information and shares it with different areas of the brain. Check it against the, the hippocampus for memories, right? Working memory to see what's going on. And then these can communicate with each other. But that's a slow process. So we have quick automatic processing, and then we have slower conscious processing. Yes, we're dual process creatures, right? And then we can in fact inhibit responses but it's much more difficult to do that than to do it automatically I want you to consider a spider crawling on your skin and you say I'm just going to experience this rather than brush it off probably difficult to do now simplify this we can talk the high road versus the low road is common terminology in this case so the stimulus we encounter stimulus the low road is the fast midbrain activation, the amygdala, straight to the hypothalamus, physiological effects, and then the result in emotion. Now, the high road, and notice these both occur simultaneously, midbrain activation, physiological effects, prefrontal cortex activation, kind of figuring out what the hell's going on, checking in on our feelings, right? But now notice, Cannon Bard, William James. This is much more like William James, right? And this is much more like Canon Bard. We have both processes available to us. So when we say who was right, James or Canon Bard, they both were. Both systems operate. So critiques then of the tri, uh, triune brain theory. 
Pinkler suggests it's a, it's a romantic doctrine. It makes a lot of sense. It's a wonderful story to tell, but it's vi largely incorrect as it explains human emotion. The hippocampus is thoroughly implicated in memory, a task considered to be decidedly cognitive. So, if it's decidedly cognitive, then what's the relationship of cognition to emotion? This is called into question and becomes more difficult. Uh, so, Ledoux points to inclus conclusive observations in brain imaging of the limbic system. And for those of you who want to study neuroscience, are planning to, are in the midst of, a great place to be looking at this point in time, because that's where a lot of answers we need are going to come from. A couple other ideas to look at at the brain level, at the neural level. Two general theories about hemispheric distinctions, right brain versus life brain, I mean right brain versus left brain. We talk reason versus emotion, Cassiopo, our own Ohio State, uh, John Cassiopo and his graduate student Wendy Gardner. Right? right hemisphere tied to mediating the expression and recognition of emotion, left hemisphere associated with the ling linguistic and anal analytic tasks. Right. Uh, Davidson comes to us with lateralization of emotional valence. And, and right hemisphere mediates positive affect, left hemisphere mediates negative affect. Some people go there, some people not on board. You probably tell from my expression, I'm like, ah, I'm not so much there, right? Okay, too simple for my tastes. Rolls presents evidence that lesions in left hemisphere are more likely to affect language processing, lesions in right hemisphere more likely to affect emotion processing, and, and those then are processed in different areas of the brain. Again, more research should be done here. So, expect hemisphericity to be contradictory. It's a relatively new science as we're looking at it now at this level. We're going to see a lot of results that contradict each other and people will sort this out. Uh, look at Tsunoda's research. Uh, Japanese people tend to process both linguistic and non-linguistic utterances on the left hemisphere. This would not be a genetic thing necessarily, right? This is going to be a cultural thing, so how does that occur? How does that make sense? Westerners tend to process non-linguistic utterances on the right hemisphere. But Japanese people raised in countries where Western languages are spoken, the difference is not observed. So go figure that out, right? And this is why we need more people operating in the realm of neuroscience to kind of do these amazing studies and, and teach us about what we're finding. So further confusion from hemisphericity then. Left-handed folks appear to have greater hemispheric integration. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. Some individuals demonstrate greater hemispheric integration than others. So. Uh, go figure that out. This is, this is just so much to learn in, in this regard. Now, in this confusing world of affective neuroscience then, the fMRI, the CT scan, right? At present, what do we find? Emotion. Uh, we find evidence that emotion affects other processes uh, in, in the brain. Attention, perception, learning, memory. And I love this model. What we're talking about here, let's start here at goals, motivations, and emotions. I show this in a bunch of different classes. Goals, motivations, emotions, I got them lumped together, right? They affect what we pay attention to in our environment. So if we're hungry, we're more likely to notice food. If we need gas and we're on a road trip, we're more likely then to be scanning the world for gas stations. If we're feeling bad about ourselves, then we might be looking to people for approval. So the goals, motivations, and emotion really kind of guide our selective attention because we can't pay attention to the whole world all at the same time, right? And then how we understand it. Now, from there, we encode, we simplify, we may elaborate, if you will, and we create memories. The memories, then, are recalled in the form of thoughts and or behaviors, cognitive output, which then affects our goals, motivation, and emotions. So this is a story of our life, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is us, right? But this, to me, this centrality of goals, motivations, and emotions that is causing this process or affecting this process, I just find that fascinating. So, affective neuroscience, what brain systems underlie emotion? Good question to ask. How do differences in these systems reflect individual differences? That is, and then, you know, kind of modify our conception of universality. There are different areas tied to different emotions in the brain, or is a central area to emotional experience in the brain and everything radiates essentially from that. 
How does the brain affect bodily processes via emotion? That is, if we're sad, notice that we often feel lethargic. That is, we don't, we're not as physically active. How does that occur? Right? How does emotion interact with other processes such as cognition, motor activity, language, and the biggie motivation? And separating motivation and emotion is an amazingly difficult task. So let's stop here and we'll go to the next part.